What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years and it's just mind blowing. Birth Story, Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a -a one-of-a-kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources. If you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth, but there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story, hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula, and I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me. But I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at Birth Story Podcast. Episode seven. Does everybody have a glass of wine? Because I've got Rachel on the podcast today. She is a friend that I met through my Bradley class. And man, she's going to take us to a place for really all three of her births that you have to hear. 
There is so much to learn from this woman, and I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Hey, everybody. I'm with Rachel Coley today. She was in my Bradley class yeah. when we were pregnant with our first baby. We were all glowing and mm-hmm. rested. Yeah. yeah. And so now um, Rachel has three babies. But we are going to talk about, um, number one, mm-hmm. Rowan's birth, and then maybe sprinkle in a little bit of your other births. So, Rachel, yes. roll. Tell everybody like who you are because I was stalking your Instagram <laughs> today because it's amazing. I am a very normal person who, um, by professional training, I'm a pediatric OT. Of course, I'm a mama first and a wife first, but uh, my business has always been pediatric occupational therapy and specifically kind of narrowing down into that baby toddler. We call it early intervention birth to three has always been my heart and my passion. And then um, when I started having my own family, I thought I'd stay at home. And then this business, I don't know if this is how it happened for you. It happens for a lot of people this way. Like it just happened to me. This business happened to me and it, it was terrible timing. And it like, it was a very, if, if someone had presented on paper, like here, you're going to launch an online business right now when you have an eight week old, I've been like, no, thanks. But it just happened. And it was so natural. It was such a marriage of my professional passions and what I was living as a mom and a new mom. And so um, I run CanDoKiddo.com, and it is an education website aimed for parents to really increase their confidence as a parent so that they can have a more playful and enjoyable parenting experience while giving their babies and toddlers the best developmental start. Um, So I have my own professional agenda to help the kids, but my heart is also in helping my fellow parents to just enjoy it. It is awesome. So I'm going to say right there, like four years ago when you were just kind of starting this business and here we were both pregnant, like Mm -hmm. for the first time. But like I literally like I'm going to go back through and tell you all the things that I did with my (laughs) first son, Max. So like we literally had this like. Oh, God, I don't even know. It was like a muffin tin. Uh And there were like golf balls or something Uh in it. And I like, yep. And he was like grabbing the golf balls. That was like one of the things that we did. The other thing was like we had a fan that we had streamers like and we like turned the fan on. And then I will never forget um, seeing pictures and you post about the Ikea. um, Mm -hmm. What is it? Activity gym. An activity gym. Yeah. But you had hung all of these um, long, like, I don't know, links off of it so that the baby could, could get it. Cause I was it. thinking, Oh, I don't even know what to do with this. Yeah. And then there was another thing. Uh, we were on a road trip or we we're getting ready to go on a road trip when Max was like six weeks old and you had posted about like how to, um, like basically decorate the, uh, car seat yeah. to entertain the baby. So yeah. All those pregnant mamas can do kiddo. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's It's been fun. And the best part for me is when parents say exactly that. Like, I was able to play with my newborn. I had no idea you could play with a newborn. And suddenly I could play. And now I understood why the play was important. Because you told me that this is why developmentally this is important. So yeah. it's really fun. Um, yeah. Well, I have learned so much from you. Well, thank you. And, um, and even more now, because um, my now three-year-old has sensory processing disorder and had a stroke so I just am on your page like every (laughs) day looking in the the toddler section for Mm -hmm. the toddler tips Mm -hmm. um and feeding tips so Mm -hmm. thank you for all that you do I'm so excited to hear about your birth journeys with the three babies so let's roll let's start with Rowan because I remember sitting in Bradley class Mm -hmm. And we're all in Bradley class for a reason. Right. Because we think we're going to have a Bradley birth. Right. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about uh, it. I so, think we might have been the only two in our class, too. In that That funny? didn't have like a, a Bradley birth. I yeah. mean, I drank orange juice yeah. at the end of the birth, but that was about as Bradley as uh, my birth got. Uh, I think we had. So. My, I know my husband had a beer. He packed a beer <laughs> for the little mini fridge in the hospital. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, Rowan's birth was interesting because. Like at least my audience, I don't know about yours, but I was like the type A high achieving professional woman who went into this thinking that I was going to design my birth and that I was going to follow the recipe. I was going to do the steps. I was going to eat the amount of protein they said and do the Kegels and and lay in this position and not sit in this position and do all do the formula to give me the birth that I wanted. And um, 
it seemed to make sense and it seemed to be like, great, that's the way I'm going to start this mothering thing. And probably this mothering thing is going to go that way too. Um, that I'm going to just find the answers and implement them and everything will be smooth. Bless um, our hearts. I Don't know. you just want to go back? I want to go back and have a conversation I just want to go back her. and like hug us. I know. And go. Bless. You know, bless, bless you. Heart. You have no idea. I feel the same coming. way about, so our three were born. We did the quote unquote baby bunching. So our three years are similar. Um, our three are less than three and a half years spread between them. And I just remember these conversations before we had kids about how this was going to be so efficient and we were going to just knock out the baby phase and then move on and they'll be close and friends. They'll be good friends or they'll be close in age. They'll be close and good friends. And like, I want to go back and have a drink with that mom and be like, yeah, slow it down. I mean, yeah, I mean, my, how it's going to look. I had a planned pregnancy at five months postpartum. Yeah. Oh, we so, were six and, months. And you were six months because yeah. I was like, I know that we were like the the first two in yep. our class also to get pregnant again. Yep. And then Maeve, how close was she? She's 22 months behind Eloise. So, so 17 16, and then 22. 22. Yeah. Whew. It is a busy household. It is over a there. loud household. Yeah. So um, Rowan, so that was kind of my expectations going into birth. I did all the things that I was supposed to do. And I, I did my quote unquote research, the beginning of <laughs> tons of mommy research. I love that term. Mommy research, a.k.a. Googling out of anxiety. Um, <laughs> and a, so during my pregnancy, my dad, um, who had terminal cancer, was put in hospice. And 11 days before I delivered, um, he passed away. And so – and it was a very complicated relationship. So the grief was really complicated. It, not to say it was better or worse or easier or harder. It was just a very, like, raw, complicated grief. Um, and so I was having prodromal labor anyway – where I was having legitimate timed contractions only at night, and then they'd fizzle. And so I was just wearing myself out, not sleeping, not sleeping, anxious. Is Thinking this, this is yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then all the self-doubt, like what's wrong with me that I thought I was deli- like in labor last night and I wasn't, and Bradley, should, you know, I should know better. So once my dad passed away, the prodromal labor that had been going on for three or four days really cranked up, and I was just miserable. I really was. And – um by the time I got to the birthing day, or actually his labor lasted two or three days, but um, mm-hmm. when it really was go time, I just, I felt really good in the beginning and I did all the things I was supposed to do. We labored at home as long as possible. And then once I got to the hospital, it just took a turn for me mentally where all the spiritual, metaphysical, universal stuff that Ina Mae had talked about in her book and all those like drum circle births, which is what I thought I was, you know, as much as you can have that in a hospital, that's what I was aiming for. It went to the other side of the spectrum for me. So all that spiritual stuff went to really dark, really painful, really lonely places. And I just got it. I was in so much pain physically, that part I was prepared for, but I was just getting my soul ripped open. Like I was already in so much pain going into birth mentally Yeah. that all the stuff that was happening during birth separate from my body just wrecked me. I was, and I was so physically tired and mentally tired. Um, and so at about 21 hours of hard labor, not even counting the beginning stuff where you can still eat and talk and all that, but 21 hours of hard, hard labor, not really progressing much. I wasn't having very frequent checks, but when they did check me, it was always like, womp, womp, you're still at a four. Um, and when you showed up at the hospital, do you remember like how many centimeters? I want to say were? I was like at a three, and I'd been laboring at home for twelve hours or something, I and mean, prodromal labor for days. Right, right, right. If not right, weeks, right. You know, before. So, While you're talking, I just want to stop right mm-hmm. there for a second and just say, like, it is triggering for me to even hear you talk yeah. because I'm just so proud of you for sharing your story. Oh. Because here I am, I'm a doula. I'm delivering this podcast and yet I still don't talk about Max's birth. Oh really? Because it's very similar to yours. Yeah. And it's hard because we do think that there and I did as a doula because I watched it unfold for fourteen you years. You knew everything, right? I knew it could be right. And many times was and I I wasn't prepared for a different a different, you yeah. know, what it shouldn't be you know but I went to that I just wanted you to hear me that I went to that very dark totally like not 
the place I was expecting birth no. to go. My other birth was therapeutic. So, I'll, yeah. you know, we'll talk about some other stuff. But I just let's say that out loud. Like yeah. sometimes birth is really long. And if you have emotional baggage going into mm-hmm. it, girl, it comes with you to that. Yeah, it does. It rips you right open. Yeah. So so 21 hours in mm-hmm. at the hospital, mm-hmm. you're like four centimeters and you're mm-hmm. like, most people are done. Most yeah. people are nursing their baby by right. now and sleeping. So right. where are you? So the the hospital, we specifically birthed at a hospital further away from our house because we heard it had a reputation for being very supportive and very natural, as natural as you could potentially get in a hospital setting in our area. So... Um, they knew we were a Bradley couple and we had expressed the wish to sort of be left alone, like do what you have to do to check periodically, but kind of give us some space to do our Bradley thing. And so the nurse came in at about 21 hours to, to just to introduce the new nurse because there was a shift change. And the new nurse who at the time I had no idea, but she was a doula on the side. She came in to introduce and it was like one of those moments of like just my gut was being wrenched and both physically and mentally. And she just swooped into my ear. I'll never forget. She was in my left ear with this, like, angelic, calm voice. And didn't even, like, just, I think she interrupted her introduction even. It was like, hi, I'm, oh, you need help. And she got there, and she just walked me through several contractions. I was at that point screaming, like, give me that patrol. I'm done. I'm done. I'm so done. Make it stop. And she's like, you know, talk to me about why, this is between contractions, talk to me about why you wanted a natural birth. Let's talk about that. What's changed for you? What if you stuck this out right now? What what would it be for? What would the outcome like? What would be the purpose of it? And finally, she said, having been through several contractions with me, she said, Rachel, this is painful. It's always painful. There's no way around this pain. But there's a difference between pain and suffering. And she said, I need you to tell me, are you in pain? Or are you suffering? And I literally said, mind, body and soul suffering. And she said, then do it. Yeah, do it. And so what that gave me and I did, I had the epidural and then he had some, you know, sort of predictable like D cells and all that kind of drama at the end. And then he came out and he's perfect and wonderful. And I had a beautiful birthing moment. Like that's the part that I didn't expect from all the Bradley stuff is things took a turn and the birth, the labor went a different way. But the, I never forget, they asked if I wanted a mirror because my first couple of pushes with an epidural were not, they were like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> let's, <Yeah. laughs> let's get you a mirror, honey. Yeah. You don't, you ain't doing Maybe that nothing. epidural is yeah. working a little too yeah. good. You're yeah. doing nothing now. I'm like, did I do it? Yeah. Um, so they brought in a mirror, which kind of at first I was like, are you sure? I don't know. I don't know if I want a mirror. It was amazing yeah. to watch and to feel, I was feeling some pressure and, you know, I just felt like I really owned the end of it yeah. and even without the pain the quote-unquote pain and so what I walked away from that experience the doula slash nurse was Kimmery and what she gave me was in the birth process a real processing of my decision so that I don't look back on that birth as like a failure or anything else it was like I had to change my decision making based on new information. Yeah. This was not the information presented to me in Bradley that this is how I was going to feel in my heart, in my soul, in my body. And so it it I'd never felt that like, oh, I failed or this sucked or I can't be proud of this birth. I mean, I felt like a warrior in that last push yeah. when he came out. It was like, yes, you yes. know, I really felt and like how I'd done it. Mi- so at hour 21, you yeah. were four centimeters and you were like, I'm defeated. Yeah. And then at somewhere around that is when you got the epidural. Right. How long until was Rowan 36 was 36 hours total. Gosh. Yeah. So it was almost double what you had already gone through. Yeah. Your body went yeah. through then with that Now epidural. I was able to rest. Once I got the epidural, I was able to rest. Okay. Some. And get a little bit of mm-hmm. sleep and stuff like that. Yeah. So my story, your story There are, we're outliers, right? Right. So you have really rapid labors, less than four hours, precipitous births that are rare. And then we have these longer than 24 hour, 48 hour, 50 hour Mm -hmm. plus, 60 hour plus births. They're also very rare. So the majority of the people listening are going to fall somewhere in the middle, right? Somewhere in that. 12 to 18 hour like first birth or whatever but it is so important to prepare for anything yeah and to 
like burst your mind like wide open Mm -hmm. with you have no control over what kind of labor you're going to be given right or what that looks like and every single baby is different but like you know i wish if i could go back and tell ourselves sitting in that bradley Mm -hmm. class like hey (laughs) it might take five days yeah or oh how long was yours with the prodromal like Like seven days oh no like two weeks two weeks yeah because it started right right before my dad passed away i started a couple of days of prodromal and then it really ran like those 11 well the last two of those days i was in labor but you know those mid that week yeah was and it's real so it's prodromal but it's real labor oh yeah it's softening the cervix it's painful contractions they're exhausting contractions Mm -hmm. and you're nervous and excited and you can't sleep And, and i will say this too they prepared the prodromal labor elicited a lot of feedback from people in the world and also from my midwives that this was preparing my body and that I would, might go quickly or that this was like somehow going to shorten my labor and uh, yeah wrong. <laughs> and, or that like oh with all this I didn't have internal checks and so it was like with all this prodromal labor you know people friends of mine would be like oh you're probably already at a three or four and like 21 hours in I was at a four mm-hmm. or whatever you know if you have prodromal labor that leads to progress right <laughs> like different. prodromal labor that leads to six centimeters dilated that sounds efficient to me yeah I was yeah. like that's good but yeah. sometimes it's no. just painful contractions yeah. that don't really go yeah. much anywhere and I didn't really talk to my midwife about it too much and I didn't I didn't have a doula and so I didn't know well you kind of did at the end you got like a free doula right right right. and unfortunately she moved like within a a week of getting pregnant with Eloise I was like Kimberly can you be my doula Um, and she was moving but we did use her partner okay Um, but yeah it was it was an interesting birth because I feel like I was gifted this processing during the middle of it yeah so let me ask you a question Mm-hmm. Did you ever go to any like counseling or anything afterwards or did you have someone that you processed the birth with like those early hours, those first 21 hours with like where you said you feel like you were just getting like ripped open or is that something that you just kind of the other births were therapeutic for? I never talked to anyone in a therapeutic context about it. Now okay. I was open with people about it. After your first, especially when you're in sort of a Bradley (laughs) group, like there's a lot of questions about your birth. And at the time, I also feel like I had friends, a lot of friends who were pregnant and having their first. And so there was a lot of conversation afterwards. So I was able to verbally just share it. And I never hid that part of my story. Yeah. Um, Just that there was so much grief and so much drama labor and, you know, that it was really long and brutal. Yeah. Um, It's so good. I ask that because it's just so important to talk about our Mm -hmm. births, Mm -hmm. whether they're great births, whether Mm -hmm. they're hard births, whether they're something in between, you know? So, but I think just like sharing and being on the podcast, telling the story, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just so important to. Yeah. And I think there's also like for me, when I think about my births, there's so much really rich metaphor in the stories. And I think that we as a society, not you and me, but, um, really sell it short and make it much more superficial. Like all the mommy war stuff or the judgment about the actual outcome and how the baby came, what orifice the baby came out of and, and how much medication and what type of medication and how many hours you went natural, whatever. All of that really sells the metaphors short because you can wind up with what you felt like it was a failure of birth. But for me, like the metaphor of Rowan's birth, um, one of the many is the relinquishing of control and you will learn that lesson as a mom you will learn it whether it's through an inter- infertility journey that it begins whether it's through your labor and delivery that it begins whether it's through postpartum that it begins whether it's through toddler parenting you're going to start the relinquishing of control lesson and you're going to learn it over and over and deeper and deeper as a parent and so i think we just need to like stop yeah <laughs> stop making birth into something so literal yeah and really embrace the metaphor no matter what your birth wound up being you know i feel like i'm in therapy right now i feel like (laughs) i'm healing from max's birth you know from just listening to you talk yeah because that really was i went into his birth like you did we we had a dream of this bradley birth and Mm -hmm. just really kind of giving that up halfway Mm -hmm. through the birth is a difficult thing to do um after the birth with Rowan, do you feel like the hospital like honored 
Like, did you do, do anything like delayed cord clamping or mm-hmm. placenta encapsulation or like skin to skin? Kind of like, what was your like afterbirth plan? Right. And, I mean, okay. We had a pretty detailed afterbirth plan. Um, the only part of it, well, there were a couple of hiccups in it. One was that my husband was going to announce the gender. All three of ours were surprise genders. And my husband was going to announce the gender, but they hold up this like baby who's got his penis in my face. And I'm like, <laughs> it's a boy. And then I was like, sorry, honey, I stole your thunder. <laughs> um, the cord, we actually, we think that they delayed the clamping. Um, we don't remember. And my husband did not cut the cord with him. And we don't remember why, how. We literally just don't have any recollection of that whole process. Um, He did have a little bit of tension in the room when he was born. They brought the neonatal team in. He turned out to be 100% fine, but just as a precaution because of some of his heart rate decels. And so I I think that kind of skewed a little bit of the birth plan. But, yeah, we were able to hold off on shots. And um, we we got a 24-hour discharge, which was our wish. We had lactation come. I mean, we just were really supported. 100% in that regard. Now, I've got some questions that are going to lead to your other births, Mm -hmm. too, because I remember you tandem nursing. Mm -hmm. So I always am very curious about this because when (laughs) I got pregnant with Max... I mean Jagger. Listen to me. I don't even know which yeah, whichever, after, I, yeah, whichever one. one. When I get pregnant with Jagger, two. <laughs> when I get pregnant with Jagger, Max's milk gone. Yeah. I mean it was gone. Yeah. So I'm always fascinated by tandem nursing. So you get pregnant again 17 months later. No, five, six months later. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah 17 yeah. months apart. Six months later, and you are still producing milk. Yeah, I mean this is another example of one of those things that like you. I think it's really good to research and have your intentions and have your goals, but like there's so much more involved than your cognitive processing of something. So yeah. my body had to cooperate with that decision. And it ha- and it was sort of like I wasn't heart set on it. It was just like, hey, if my body cooperates with this, I was able to get pregnant while nursing. My baby's less than a year. Like let's see how far we can run with this thing. And then at some point it was like, oh man, I guess maybe I'm going to tandem nurse. Like I, that yeah. wasn't ever something I dreamed of or hoped for. Yeah. Um, and I did it twice. I've been continuously nursing since June of 2014. Ugh. You are amazing. <laughs> so, or insane. Woo. I just got uh, a hot flash. Yeah, right? I'm thinking about it. Down, yeah. I'm just thinking about it. Tingling. Yeah. So my first two tandem nursed and then I solo nursed Eloise for a little while and then Eloise and Maeve tandem nursed until Eloise weaned. So now just wow. Maeve is the only one riding the milk truck now. Oh my goodness. Okay. So maybe uh, if you don't want to answer this question, I could always cut this out, but do you guys want to have any more children? No. Okay. So you're and good. And you don't have to cut that out. Okay. I was like, we you're done with three. We stick a fork in us. Okay. We have no, we're so out of capacity <laughs> like we just couldn't yeah um well three in three years basically four years yeah. is a lot so. and they're not easy kids I mean I know no kids are easy but Rowan and Eloise did not have a good adjustment at 17 months to each other Rowan had a very hard time okay having a baby that close in age and continues to I mean that's just been a real struggle so yeah, we're maxed out. Yeah. Our house is loud enough. And oh we're not goodness. we're not super young, believe it or not. If you know him in real life. Okay. My husband is fifty three. This is mind blowing. Everyone right now is are there pictures of your husband on Can Do Kiddo? Um, a few. Yeah. Okay. Not a ton, but a few. Here's another reason to go to Can Do Kiddo <laughs> and follow. Because this will blow your mind when you see it's her not, husband. Totally hot, so hot. Oh, thank you. And I agree. Looks like he couldn't possibly be more than 35 years old it's not fair and when i married him i'm not kidding you i thought you are not 53 let's just no but i'll be 38 in a few weeks so i feel like our timing it was like if we had a little more time and we had spaced our kids further and maybe had easier kids maybe not um we maybe would have i think our dream was to have four and then reality again it's another thing where it's like it's good to have intentions it's good to talk about these things and have plans and then it's also good to be like let's be realistic about where we are and make a new decision yeah you know, and feel really good about that. Yeah, we a hundred percent were gonna have four. And then while I was pregnant with number two, fifteen, I was like, no, this is it. We're good. We're oh, done. done. Yeah. Hey, it's Heidi. I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know about a free resource that I've created for you at birthstory.com. All you have to do is go to birthstory.com and then click the tab that says the workbook. Once you put your email address in, an entire resource library of all of my secret sauces are available to you for free as my thank you for listening to the Birth Story podcast and being part of this community. 
At birthstory.com, under the workbook, you will find a birth plan template, articles on circumcision, delayed cord clamping, flipping a breech baby, packing your hospital bag, acupressure points, placenta encapsulation, and so much more. There are over 20 free articles ready for you to download at birthstory.com. Now let's get back to this amazing episode. So let's go back to Eloise, number two. Mm-hmm. So you're able to still be nursing Rowan, which mm-hmm. is unbelievable. Did did you feel contractions? Like, did it make mm-hmm. your uterus contract? Yes, especially okay. at the end. Okay, because I had I've had a few clients through the years that did this, and um, they were very concerned about miscarrying early on in the pregnancy if they continued to nurse because of the uterine contractions, which is very false right so and was that that ever a concern for you no I never really felt them early on um I have very strong Braxton Hicks all three times um that start around 20 22 weeks they got a little earlier each time but that was really what I felt was really strong Braxton Hicks when I would nurse and sustained that basketball belly would hang around for a minute or two um it wasn't until the very end that they started it, w- it would feel like that prodromal labor feeling where it would yeah. be like crampy. Um, but it's funny because um, Eloise was 10 days late, which is very strange for a second. Or not very strange, but again, an outlier. Yeah. Day, everyone's like, oh, it's your second. You'll go early. So my mind is prepared for that. You'll go faster. My mind's prepared for that. Um, yeah, false and false. But she, um, I, one of the pieces of advice everybody gave me was like, you should stimulate breasts, start pumping. I'm like, dude, I have a nursing baby. Right. Like, I'm, I'm Can't good on that. Can't stimulate them yeah. anymore. Exactly. Um, yeah. So a little bit, a little bit different the second time around with that. Yeah. But. Okay. So tell me about the like day or night that you went into labor with Eloise. Like, what did it look like having a toddler? Like, oh. that you have to do something with Which, in order to labor. Interestingly, when I was pregnant with Eloise, that was the bigger concern. I think this is pretty common, especially if you have um, a young toddler when you're pregnant the second time around or third time around. My biggest concern was for my toddler's well-being. What am I going to do with him? Who's going to care for him? Will he be scared? He'd never really been away from us overnight because he was still nursing. Yep. And um, so that was really my more my concern until I went into labor. Once, once I was in labor, I was like, wait, Rowan who? Yeah. Um, <laughs> take me to the hospital. Get me out of here. Um, but I actually wound up going into labor on day 10 from a membrane sweep. I had a um, okay. scheduled induction, which I did not want to do. But obviously at 10 days post date, they're like, mm, pressure, pressure, least, pressure, pressure. Well, we pressure. at least have to get it on the books. And I was done. I was so done. Yeah. Like, so. And when you've had the experience like your first, sometimes it is a very big sense of relief mm-hmm. when they're like, no matter what. On Tuesday, you're going to be in labor with controlled contractions, and you're going to have a baby. And we didn't get there, so the induction was scheduled for a few days later. So you had it, though. So you were like, okay, definitely have this day. By Friday, baby will be here. But let's just do the membrane sweep to see what happens. Which I was totally willing to do because it it felt more natural. I talked to my doula about it, and it was like it felt more natural than the induction. This felt like a better alternative. Yeah. Were you dilated already? hardly no, i think okay. maybe like i was too um, hey i mean it's something yeah. but and i don't think i was very a faith i think i was like 40 percent, or you know okay. it's something has yeah. was happening but nothing dramatic they weren't telling me you're gonna go into labor tonight like they do some yeah. people they're like ah, let's sweep your men yes yeah. <laughs> um and that worked pretty efficiently like within i don't know three or four hours things started moving and um our doula came. We labored without a doula for a while, while it was comfortable. And then at about 2 a.m., she came over and continued to labor at home. We did all the Bradley stuff. And this time around, our intention and our goal was to try for a natural birth. But we at least entertained the possibility that, like, if we get to a, a place like I did last time, I will not feel like a failure if I wave the white flag. Yeah. So we're okay with any And you outcome. will not suffer again right 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 right. right. I was not going to go near that place yeah good for Um, you and so and I don't when when we say suffer like you and I both know because we've been there but we're not talking about like this hurts really bad we we mean like soul suffering you know like it is it's very different it's hard to even verbalize yeah I literally was saying things like I'm alone in a desert dying someone's and why is no one saving me yeah I (laughs) so and I'll be really transparent I didn't even think I was going to go here with anyone ever But when I had to fill out the paperwork at the end of the hospital stay that says, 
ha- do you have suicidal thoughts? I wrote on the paperwork I did during labor mm-hmm. because I absolutely did. Yeah. It was not, it was not, again, not the pain. It was like almost like the fatigue mixed with pain yeah. unleashes something inside of you that is dark. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, just give me a cesarean or God bring me to heaven Yeah, because I'm done. Yeah. I cannot be, I felt like I was being tortured. Well, and I felt like because of the (laughs) terrible, I should not be telling all these things on this podcast, but it's a learning experience. And the the combination of that soul pain plus the duration. So it's like, I can't live in this space anymore. And I've been in this space for hours. You know, there's, there's a difference between dipping your toe in that water and being like treading water in that water for so long. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, So Eloise's birth, very, 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 very slow did not and zero progression like literally so zero. your doula is there at the house yeah you and at transition. some point we um at some point we moved to the hospital okay they checked me and it was sage i think we've shared a um a midwife but yes and she checked me and she I was love like her. oh well technically you're not in active labor because they had changed the rules right so now it's a six isn't that right you have to be a six to be considered active labor I don't know. Dilated to a six. It used to be a four that they had to admit you or whatever. I keep my clients at home for a really long time. Well, times. <laughs> I was at home for a really long time. But um, I was like, hmm. But, I don't know. Well, and the other thing, because we birthed further away, there was a traffic factor that sent us to the hospital a little before we normally would have because yeah. it was going to be rush hour. And we had to okay. like fight the rush hour traffic. So it was like four o'clock. I think it was like, well, let's go ahead and go and beat the traffic. So, um, but I mean, I was I was laboring hard. Um, and then, uh, just didn't progress at all, at all. Like my cervix was going nowhere for hours and hours and hours. And finally they said, um, we can do several things, but one of the things we can do is break your water. I said, let's do that first. And then we'll talk about Pitocin later, but give me a little time with the broken water and see what we can do. So they broke my membranes. Um, and then things amped up even more of course as i knew they would my doula knew they would and then after i don't know time stands still 75 hours no i'm just joking a <laughs> couple of hours um i was things were stacking up like i was getting no break between contractions i was having all those weird hiccupy nauseous burpy ugh. and i was like i'm done i'm done i want the epidural and my doula was like are you if we checked you, because again, I wasn't getting a lot of checks. She was like, if we checked you and you were a nine, would that change things for you? And I was like, yeah, I think I could do it. And she was like, well, let's let's get you checked and just see, because I really think you're in transition. Okay. I think I was at like a four. Oh, so you totally tricked everyone. Yes. And this I didn't, happens I will so not often. tell you what words came out of my mouth. Because yeah. again, it was literally like the 21 hour mark. Yeah. 21, 22 hours. Okay, so let me just interject right here as a doula because I have been tricked many times before too. And it turns out that when I see this happen, it's mm. the position of the baby. Mm. The baby is either face up or the head is turned to the side and is not coming down right. to put pressure on the cervix. Yeah. But the contractions are the intensity right. of the end of labor. So it's almost like the position of the baby and the stage of labor are not in sync right. with each other. Yep. So like I'm tracking right there with your doula because I would have been like, yes, let's check but then right then i would have known we have to get the baby to turn right and come down right you know so um, and also interestingly i don't know from your doula perspective what this is but definitely with my first two babies during prodromal labor and during real labor being on my side was horrible and i know that they say in bradley like go into the pain if if a certain position hurts worse go there but it was more than that it was like completely intolerable like it would cause me to have weird reflexes and stuff because it was just so intense yep and so i mean i could never figure out was that better or should i've gone there more it actually was the position that also ca- caused the d cells, cells. for See, i'm the opposite i'm like we're we're gonna move you out of it not into it right and yeah. they did so my philosophies i'm like leaping out of the bed to get out of it yeah um so anyway so i did wind up getting an epidural with eloise around the same 
point, 21, 22 hours. Now, from that point on, it was a little bit faster. I think she was about a 28-hour labor total. Okay. Um, Talk to me a little bit right there about the epidural, though. Like, so for everybody listening, mm -hmm. and we're trying to teach everybody something. Like, if you're, you have this beautiful Bradley birth plan, you know, but you're at the 21, 22-hour mark, an epidural is a tool to help you have a beautiful birth many times. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like, what does it look like to get an epidural? Like, what did it feel like? Like, what, what okay, was so it like? I can actually talk about two different visions of it. So yeah. with babies number one and two, it felt like being terrified because I knew it involved some sort of needle in your back. You can't see it, but like it, that just, that conceptually felt very scary. Um, and I never even saw the doctor either time. Like, no one ever came around that side of the bed because they've already got you prepped on the side of the bed. You're bent yeah. over a pillow. And I always thought it was strange. Like, you're an angel from heaven about to give me an epidural, but you're not going to come around and face-to-face -face introduce yourself or anything. They just, like, swept into the room, draped you, scrubbed you with some cold stuff. And then with Rowan, it was pretty – it was like having a shot in your back, basically. But with Eloise, um, I, f I felt, like, weird zings down my legs, like, kind of nerve things. And they said it was okay, but it was very scary because it doesn't feel okay mm -hmm. in your body. You're like, ooh. What's that's a, a very strange sensation, um, and then it slowly starts to work, and they give you a little button, and if it's not working as well, you click it again and get yeah. more. I have. Very, do they ask you the questions like, do you have a funny taste in your mouth or ringing in their, your yeah, ears? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And I do have very low blood pressure anyway, and did throughout pregnancy, and so I always have a hard time with um, blood pressure drops. So I'll get really like kind of groggy headed and like um feel kind of nauseous and they'll yeah. check my blood pressure and say oh yep yep and they then they give me epinephrine and they have to keep doing that pretty much for the rest of my labor yeah just to keep me at a healthy blood pressure yeah um and it does slow things down i mean it's hard to say in the first two but with mave i will say i think it slowed things down which is what we learned in bradley um and you're stuck in the bed so there's not the ability to move around and all of that but um did they have the peanut balls yes. at the hospital mm -hmm. by then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I remember when they did about three or four years ago, they were doing the trial of the peanut balls. Mm -hmm. So so you, did they give you the peanut balls? I don't remember it with Rowan. Um, I do remember it both in labor before the epidural with Eloise. They put me on my side with a peanut ball and I literally threw it across the room when I had a contraction because it was just so – that position was so bad. But um, – I don't remember it after the epidural with Eloise. Maeve, definitely. So I had an epidural all three times. My third epidural was more planned. Like I had an epidural right when I checked in. Yeah. Um, like, hey, I'm not messing with all that. Yeah, like, let's just yeah. go for that. And Well, and I also, I had sort of the same birth plan in my mind. Like, let's go natural as long as we can and then do the epidural. But I was progressing quickly. It was my third baby in three years. Yeah. And your for, body figured it out. once, my cervix <laughs> was like, wait a second. I think I'm supposed to open here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did wind up with some Pitocin with Eloise, my second. Okay. Um, because. To pick things back up. It just was not. Well, it just never progressed without an epidural, without the, I mean, with the rupture of membranes like nothing was getting it going yeah um and so they wound up give me some put it and that's the point at which i also had the epidural kind of consecutive like all at once i'm gonna interject just right here the fact that you are delivering with sage in with midwives in this particular hospital mm -hmm. i am certain that is why you had vaginal births oh i agree you have especially so many people listening have this same story Mm -hmm. and ended up in a cesarean well, section. Well, and with Rowan, with the D-cells and all that, yeah. we could tell at the end that we were – that was the decision on the table, and at any second it was going to go that way. I mean, they were literally saying things yeah. like, let's watch him through – or it. They didn't know what it was. Let's watch baby through one more contraction. Yeah. Like, I mean, we knew we were on the chopping block, the literal chopping block. Yeah. Um, and luckily, for whatever reason, I think they were like, let's do one more check. And, like, I was crowning. I mean, I – like – yeah. Boom. He's there. Okay. Just <laughs> okay. kidding. Let's go ahead and get him out. Yeah. Um, but yes, I agree. I think that the Bradley preparation, being very intentional about having midwives, having a doula the second time around, um, particular hospital chosen because they're supportive of natural, all those things, despite the fact we wound up having more interventions than my idealistic Bradley student mind wanted, yeah. I still got the vaginal birth. But also knowing when to use the medical the interve intervention. Exactly. Like timing of the epidural is yep. so important. Yeah. Like 
the further you go, the better your Mm -hmm. outcome. And Mm -hmm. so like, I just hear so much strength pouring out of you that you like rose through all of that. I mean, just rock star status. And I'm a really good pusher too, guys. I mean, like we're talking. Well, you're in a very good shape. (laughs) So I'm like, you're in very good shape. I think squats would become very easy for you, you know. Um, And then, yeah, so my third baby, um, I actually, when I checked in and we went to the hospital quickly, I, I had a membrane sweep. I was a few days late. She was like 41. No, she was 40 plus six or something like that. So okay. she was late, but not or post date. Obviously, my cycle is funky. I mean, that's the only answer for why I have a second and third baby that were um, that late. But um, she I had a memory and sweep instantly went into labor, like in the parking lot, had my first real legit contraction. Where okay. I was like, oh, it's go time. Had to go home, pick my, this is like third mom, third time mom, had to pick my kids up from preschool. Right. Like I'm not ready for labor. Yeah. Like, I'm uh-uh. like, uh-uh, I'm stalling. <laughs> um, this can't be happening today. Um, and that was like at 11 or 1130. I had a membrane sweep. And at two o'clock, I was in the hospital. In fact, when I called the midwives to say like the office to say, hey, I'm headed to the hospital. She w- the girl was so confused because I had a non-stress test at 11. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm in labor like <laughs> two or three hours later. Cancel um, the NST. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I'd already had one that morning. Oh, you had already yeah, had at like it. like 11 a.m. Oh, so you had the NST and the membrane sweep yes. together. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so they were all sorts of confused. And this but- is literally three hours later. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm at the hospital, checked in at a six. And let me tell you, Heidi, like, were you like... I'd, I'd never gotten to a six before. Yes. Like, I mean, I guess with Le- yes. with Rowan at I like mean, you delivered hours. your babies vaginally, so yes, eventually. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah. like on my own. Oh. Well, with Eloise was with Pitocin and with Rowan was probably with 30 hours of labor and an epidural. So I was like, what? I'm at a six. I was like high-fiving. Yeah. Um, and wound up getting I was like I want to labor as naturally as possible for as long as possible and they're like girl if you want an epidural you better get one now like we gotta get this okay and you did not use a doula on number three no and we just that was a very intentional decision for financial reasons okay (laughs) because we decided to allot that money towards postpartum help for our toddlers because we were going to bring a newborn home yeah two toddlers yeah who are hard kids who don't get along like it just was like that's where we needed our support yep. was postpartum. If um, you don't, anyone listening, if you don't have a doula financially, it is very important to, I'm just going to say this because mm-hmm. it is, there are so many doulas who are available, who do payment plans mm-hmm. and who are um, training mm-hmm. and who need births to get experience. Yeah. So I just want to kind of interject really that right there. So if someone is willing and really wants to have, like, where there's a will, there's a way. So if there is someone out there listening that does want a doula and but doesn't have $1,500, right. frankly, to spend on a doula, then um, there are options That's good to out know. there. So doulas and training are a really good, especially if you're on baby three, right? Yeah. Like, this is not your first you know, shindig, you kind of right. know what's going on, you know what you need and some support, and you may be able to really help a new doula in training. So I'm just yeah. going to interject right That's there. really so. good. I think we were so, so focused because we'd had one for our second, and so we only ever considered her. Yeah. So I was like, well, we don't want to pay the $1,500 or whatever it was for yeah. her, even though she's amazing and worth every penny, but we would rather use that amount of money for a babysitter. To take but, care But we didn't of... even consider alternative. Yeah. You know, so that's affordable. why I just interjected yeah, that's a little awesome. bit. It is so important to have that plan mm-hmm. for your toddlers. Like, even if you don't have oh, money, gosh. find the money to have babysitters yes. so that you have some postpartum silence yep. with just one baby. And we, so another, whether you edit this out or not, I think it's important to at least automatically it. not editing it. And I don't even know what you're going to say. So um, just say it. So Preach, the mama. first time around, <laughs> I had my first baby boy. I was so excited. And we, at the time I was working or had been working for our church. So a lot of people interested in seeing this baby. And, and we got married at our church and met at our church. So like just a very big community. And people wanted to bring us meals. And it was so generous and so wonderful and so flipping overwhelming for me. And you don't know what you're going to need or want postpartum until you're there. And yeah. so it never even occurred to me 
to have any sort of plan for visitors. Um, and I had a summer baby, and I'm not super anxious about germs. So I, it wasn't that. It was literally like I was in so much recovery pain and also needed to do so much for my own body and like figure out this nurse it's not like when you have a three-day-old you're like throwing a nursing cover over you and like doing it it's a three-ring milk squirting circus or at least it was for me like you're like how do I even put this nursing cover on and like how do I hold the baby's head up to my boob yeah like and and I'm like literally spraying like a fire hydrant (laughs) out the other side and everything's kind of sore yeah and then you're going how many holes are on? Like, I don't know if you're like me. I thought there was like one hole on your nipple that like milk came oh, out. I didn't realize there it's was like, like a sprinkler. 20. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. The things just, you don't know. No. Exactly. So my, um, that was one of the things that my doula really helped with the second time was like, let's make sure we have a plan for, for people afterwards. And then um, when we were talking about the third time around, really wanting that postpartum kind of babysitter support, extra set yeah. of hands. We do have my in-laws are local and we have people that we could have called on and I felt really vulnerable. Like there was something about it. It was like, I don't want a family member that's not, I mean, my mom would be different, but like, I don't want a sister-in-law or a mother-in-law or it just, I had and a real privacy thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was much more willing the second and third time around to kind of honor that and be like, I don't want visitors. I've learned through experience that I don't want visitors. And so my, my advice to someone the first time around, since you don't know how your body's going to feel after birth, how your psyche is going to feel after birth is to plan air on the side of fewer people and then call on people if you need or want them. Does that make sense? Um, Because it's a whole lot easier to say yes, come than to say no, you know, in the moment, no, I don't want to see you. Um, And I feel like, which isn't really what you mean. It's just like, no, I need, I need my sacred space. No, I, well, and also I need to be in a sits bath every like two hours. And yeah. that's not. I remember saying, if you want to come over and do my dishes, great. But yeah. like, I don't need anyone else to hold my baby besides yeah. me. Yeah. And right with, now. with Ro- Rowan was having, from my sec- when my second was born, my firstborn was having a really hard time when visitors came over because everyone was ooing and eyeing over the baby and. Yeah. So, well, this is a good. They didn't ask me to do this, but I'm actually going to plug right here. Anyone local in Charlotte, Queen City Newborn Care. Mm-hmm. I don't know who you used, but this organization run by Meg Coffee is amazing, and it is a network of postpartum caregivers mm-hmm. that do um, night support mm-hmm. postpartum support i mean just kind of all of it just Everything. pampering moms like post birth and it's a really beautiful organization and so i just wanted to put that in there like yeah. for anyone who's kind of maybe feeling or thinking that they're going to feel kind of like how you are feeling like you don't want your sister in law but you do want help someone yeah yeah it felt better and and the support we got the third time around was just babysitters for the toddlers just someone in the evening yeah so dinner bedtime just an extra set of hands to help my husband handle that or just to give me the space to either be nursing baby or take a minute to cuddle a toddler while the other two were you know being cared for so um so anyway that was that was different the third the second time was very different and then the third time was really different because we actually enlisted some support there yeah so if you could look back on like all three births and experiences like do you have a favorite moment or a funny moment like I that you tell do. stories about? I do have a funny moment. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, with Rowan going. This is when I went into labor. Was It was a Monday night. I will never forget it. I had been at a women's group. My husband had been somewhere. It was about 9 p.m. And my husband has a bunch of friends through rock climbing who are younger, single, like just in a different stage of life than we were at the moment about to have a baby and I'm driving it's dark nine o'clock pulling in my driveway and I see a bunch of cars parked on our street which isn't super unusual but I'm like I literally thought to myself someone's having a party and then I see a guy walking down the sidewalk with a six-pack and he turns and walks down my driveway and I'm like what it turns out as I pull in the drive um mind you like 39 weeks pregnant or 38 weeks pregnant um our friend, one of my husband's friends, had had him through himself a going away party at our house, unbeknownst to us. So I pull in, and there's like 30 people on my back patio. And hashtag like, clueless. 
Oh my gosh. So, and P.S. My dad had just died. Like, it was just kind of like, off. dude. I mean, yeah. Dude. Um, Is this person still in your life? Yes. Okay. And we love him, and okay. it's totally fitting for him to do this. Okay, but then we're sorry we're laughing about no, you. No, right he'll never now, listen but, to this podcast. Okay. But, um, so anyway, so I go inside. I'm, I I make my hellos. I try to be friendly. And these were not close friends of mine. These are my husband's friends. I go inside. I'm like, what? Who does this? Oh, my God. So I'm steaming and fuming. I go upstairs. I told. I kind of whispered to my husband, like, I, I got to go to bed. Like, this is insane. And I, I'm i upstairs and I'm starting labor. And I'm like, I think it's not prodromal, but I'm not quite sure yet. So I'm just like, t- what did I say? I said, shut it down in a text message. I said, shut, shut it, it down. down. <laughs> then I hear this friend, the qu- friend in question, and my husband talking in the kitchen. I, I look out the window and it looks like most people have left. And I hear cabinets slamming. And in my head, the story I'm creating is that they're getting into the liquor cabinet. And my husband's not a big drinker at all. But with this particular friend, I could see him, like, having a few shots of whiskey. Or I don't know what they would drink. I'm sort of like, great. He's going to be, like, shit canned when it's time to drive me to the, air- or to the airport, the hospital. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. The, time I will, for Uber. Uh, I, will, I will never forget <laughs> just, like, the mama rage of, like, you're violating my space. I think my body was already knowing that it was coming. Yeah. N- my, not in my mind, but my body was doing all of its hormonal stuff to prepare. Yeah. And I just went into this rage of, like, this is my space. And not only are you violating it, but you're violating it in the most, like, clueless, disrespectful way. Like, yeah. you threw yourself you a party no at my idea. house. And I'm in labor upstairs. Um, yeah. So. Someday this person may or may not yeah. have an idea yeah. of that. Um, well, I love everything that I've learned <laughs> from you today yeah. and just sharing. Like, I really feel like, honestly, like, I feel like I've been in a little bit of therapy and I also feel like I might have shared too much, but no. whatever. And so before we're done, do you have a favorite baby product or baby products that you used that you want to share about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my new recent favorite, I actually didn't use because it came out like a few months when Maeve was like a little bit past the stage. We use it a little bit now, but um, there's a company called Love Every, which is all one word, L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y. Um, and they started out making a play gym, which is beautiful and awesome and i had one and loved it with Maeve but they recently came out with play kits and it's a subscription box that comes every once every two months but they really far and away more than anyone else enlisted the help of developmental professionals and so every two months if you subscribe you can eat you can buy each box individually but it aligns with the baby's development it sends you toys it sends you a whole um, manual of activities you can do and understanding your baby's development it even includes a little gift for mom every month because you know what you're doing is hard they sent me as just to review their product and try it they sent me all of the months for the first year so it's six boxes and each one stuck cram packed with all this stuff and I spread this stuff out I opened it all at once and my kids are going crazy going through it all and I literally thought to myself like this is all you need literally this is like the best toys on the market aligned with your baby's development and literally it's enough that that's it that's all you need you wouldn't have to stress about anything else a disgusting playroom that is cluttered with things they don't need and they're all like beautiful wooden you know like all the they're Perfect. they're visually appealing, so you feel yeah. like you're a cool, trendy mom. But they're so spot on with development. Okay, like I'm going to do a link in the show notes, and yeah. I'm like, cannot wait to go look this. Yeah, up and I'll send you my affiliate link so that they know that it came from me. And so. it's also a great gift for like grandparents and people that want to buy you all the things, but you don't really know what you need or yeah. you know, don't want it more clutter. It's a great gift to send. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so excited! All right, let's high five it, and then we'll pretend like we go back and tell our. Uh, like very young Bradley oh, selves, yes. you know, release control. Yeah, hold everything. It's not that you don't hold it. You hold it with a really loose grasp. Yeah. Well said. Rachel, like anybody who like loved at the beginning here about hearing about can do kiddo and like listening to your story, but like tell us a little bit more about how to get in touch with you and like why brand new parents need some of the stuff that you're offering? Mm, good question. So um, why new parents need some of the stuff that I'm offering is because I am all about early intervention, which really means that you head things off early on and you support, pro- you, you're proactive. You support positive development. You support what your baby's working on. You support good bonding and connection between mothers and new babies um, so that we don't have to fix a lot of problems longer term. And it's also really important because some of the problems that we're seeing um, 
on the rise with newborn babies are things that pediatricians are still saying, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. They have a little flat spot on their head. Let's wait and see. And there are things that instead of waiting and seeing that we could be doing um, to head, sorry for the pun, to head some of this stuff off. So um, I wrote a book that basically gives parents all of my OT knowledge about preventing flathead syndrome in babies, which is a growing epidemic, and um, also for doing their best to avoid a helmet if their baby already has flattening. It's not a guarantee, but there are things you can do that are not wait and see. Um, and and just proactive playing with your baby and the things that can help combat all of our fears as a parent, all of the, am I doing enough? Is my baby okay? What All those new mom anxieties and new dad anxieties can really be alleviated with just a little more knowledge and a little more, more enjoyment of the newborn phase because it's hard. <laughs> That phase is hard. Yeah. So, so where, like, so if somebody's listening and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, like either I'm pregnant or like my best friend's pregnant or mm-hmm. like, and like you need this book, <laughs> like you need this book because yeah. as a new mom, you are going to be staring at your newborn and being like, what do I mm-hmm. do with you all day right. long? And there is so much. So like, how do we, how do we get this book? Um, well, there's a couple of ways. So I think or that, these books, I'm sorry, uh, really, yeah, there's, books. there's a bunch of books, but the, um, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is on my homepage, can do kiddo.com. That's C-A-N-D-O. K-I-D-D-O. Um, there are a bunch of free email courses for parents where they can kind of dip their toe in the water of this information and you can pick the topic. So maybe you want to learn about playing with your baby. Maybe you want to learn about avoiding the, the um, helmet and avoiding flathead syndrome. Maybe you want to learn about tummy time and how to start doing tummy time really early, um, which is what's recommended is for a full-term healthy infant from the first day, week of life. Um, And so kind of be proactive in your parenting through some of these email courses. And then if you want to dig deeper, um, also on my website, there's a section that shows the books that are about baby play, the books, uh, the book about flathead syndrome, um, play geocephaly, and then the three courses that I have, which are about tummy time and uh, feeding your baby solids, starting solids, and then one-year-old development. I have a big old course all about following your baby through one-year-old development. Okay. Like, wait, did I hear you right? You said, you had free courses? Yes, I have free email courses where I drop in your inbox every day for about a week and I just give you lessons about stuff I want you to know as a new mom. And then if you want to dig deeper, you can always um, get some of the paid products, but there's an easier way to start than that. Okay, this sounds fantastic. And like (laughs) right now I'm like tag, tag, tag every single mom that I like, you know, helped doula over the last couple of months. I'm going to be like sending emails tomorrow. So awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go, and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy.